I'm going to introduce our Smith Stanford speaker for this year, Dr. Cameron Braun. And I have just a few things. I've tried to keep it short, but I know Cameron very, very well, so it might go a little bit longer. Um, so Cameron was, uh, was uh, born and raised in Bear Lake, Idaho, so way down um, the eastern portion, southeastern portion of Idaho. Um, he came to the College of Idaho in 2007, and as a freshman, he decided he wanted to study psychology, which I didn't know that until, until yesterday. But um, he took some biology and environmental studies courses and decided that he would switch his major uh, to environmental studies with a conservation biology focus. Um, and then over the next four years here at the College of Idaho, Cameron was pretty much involved with all the things that C of I offers our students. Um, but most notable, at least in my opinion, was his interest in research. So while he was here, he did research on Idaho ground squirrels. He did research on red band trout, on largemouth bass, on butterfly fish, and on whale sharks, if you can believe that. So, and he'll talk a little bit about that, I think, uh, during his presentation. So during his undergraduate career, he gave, I think, nine conference presentations. He published a paper. He's the only undergrad that I've had that's published a scientific paper before graduating, so I was very impressed. Um, and he was also a student Boy. on the uh, Australia trip uh, that was led by myself and Dr. Gunderson. This was 2010, was and that's, that's Cameron <laughs> over there on the right wearing the short shorts. <laughs> uh, there's another story there, and if we had more time we could go into it, but uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, but this expedition to Australia really changed, I think, Cameron's course, um, his career path. And after this experience, he decided to apply for a summer REU program, research experience for undergrads. Some of you may know about that program. And he applied for a program at Woods Hole, which is part of MIT. Um, it's uh, a very prestigious uh, uh, place to study oceanography. And so Cameron was accepted into the lab there and spent the summer between your junior and senior year doing that research. Um, and then that led to uh, a master's program after he finished here at the C of I. He did a master's program at King Abdullah uh, Science and Technology University in Saudi Arabia. And that's where he did his manta ray research. And then from there, he went back to Woods Hole um, and studied uh, whale sharks and other pelagic animals and did his uh, PhD. And he just finished his PhD like September. six months ago? Yes. September. Um, and then, just last week, he was offered a position as assistant professor of biology at the School for uh, Aquatic and Fishery Sciences at the University of Washington. So it's going to be great having Cameron back um, here in the Pacific Northwest. And he might start to do some more trout research, which I'm all for. And, and. Yes. Um, <laughs> So Cameron's done amazing things. He's um, written over 20 papers since he graduated that have been published. He's received many, many grants totaling lots and lots of uh, dollars. Um, he's traveled internationally to talk about sharks and his research. And I did come across a picture the other day of Cameron. Oh boy. Um, 
And when I first looked at it, I thought, you know, I don't think I've ever seen Cameron relax. <laughs> and so I think this is the last time I saw him relax. That's, this was 2010 in Australia. And I don't know what you're thinking about there. Maybe you're thinking about whale sharks. I doubt it. But um, uh, it's just a great honor to have Cameron come back and speak to us about all he's done. So with that, I'll turn it back over <laughs> to Cameron. Good. Stop him before he shows any more embarrassing pictures. There's quite a few out there. <laughs> the shorts were really quite short. Um, so, as you guys probably saw in the, the advertisements and stuff that went around campus, I want to talk to you today about um, kind of a, a big picture view of the work that I've been doing on the ecology of top marine predators in a changing climate and ocean. Um, I'm really interested in how these animals interact with their ocean environment, as also, also what that means for the management and the conservation of these ecosystems. Um, but I also thought that rather than just kind of giving you the fire hose of science, I'll um, also try to give you a little bit of insight into my journey, um, some of the things that I've learned along the way that maybe will be helpful for you guys as aspiring science-y type of people. Um, and I'll kind of weave those two things together for you today, so hopefully it's not just a, a science fire hose. So one of the reasons I'm personally so excited about this work is that the ocean is one of these last frontier environments on our planet. So it's this vast, super remote landscape that we as scientists still uh, have very little understanding of. Um, and I think it's actually pretty accurate that we know more about the surface of our moon than we know about uh, our very own ocean. So that's, that's one of the kind of main motivators for me. In contrast to that, the ocean has never been more heavily utilized from things like fishing activities, shipping traffic, and, and other uses. So here I'm just showing you a figure from a, a paper last year in science that shows just for one year the, uh, the hours of fishing effort per square kilometer in the ocean. And what you'll notice is that a huge swath of the open ocean is colored in. And there are some areas where you see kind of these hot spots in yellow, where there's super intense fishing pressure in those places. So there's this interesting juxtaposition between an environment, especially be below the surface of the ocean, that we as scientists know almost nothing about, and yet the exploitation of this environment looks something like this. So to me, this is um, maybe kind of sad, but also really interesting and provides a, a scientific opportunity um, you know, in, in juxtaposition with this fishing activity. And, and of course, we're exploiting a lot of the resources in the ocean at a pretty dramatic rate and scale. And this is kind of what that looks like. So, you know, we're, we're exploiting in particular a lot of the long-lived, slow-growing gro species like top predators, and I focus a lot on sharks. And so, you know, this is a, I think, depicts that exploitation pretty well. This is a photo from uh, a fish market in Dubai where you see just, you know, hundreds of large um, you know, fully grown adult pelagic, that's open ocean sharks, set out for sale. And so this isn't just happening to sharks, right? And it's not just happening in Dubai, but it's happening all over the world and to all kinds of, of marine animals like tunas, um, marine mammals, primarily as bycatch, also sharks, turtles, uh, all kinds of other species. And these are uh, all obviously caught in staggering numbers worldwide every day. Uh, our estimates are about 100 million sharks are harvested per year. Which I can't wrap my brain around that number. I'm not sure if you guys can either, but it's, but it's big. Um, and, you know, this doesn't account for, like I mentioned, all the other bycott species, the things that are captured and killed uh, in, sort of incidentally while we're trying to catch the, the target species. On the other hand, harvest of marine resources is actually pretty important, right, for, for society. So fisheries feed about 2 billion people annually, and the fishing industry supports about $200 billion in economic activity. So we can't just stop fishing, right? Like that's not, that's not the answer here. So when I walked away from the College of Idaho um, more years ago than I care to admit, armed with a, a liberal arts degree in environmental studies and conservation biology, in some sense I think I felt uh, a bit of an obligation to uh, apply my scientific knowledge to try to make some kind of positive change in this arena. Um, and so, you know, I was most interested in the human impacts on our planet, I think, in 2011 when I left here. That was kind of my, my focus. And when, as I moved more and more into the marine environment, I realized that 
in an age of intense fishing pressure and other anthropogenic threats to our ocean by climate change, maybe it's a pretty appropriate time for me to focus on some of those marine species that we have the greatest impact on, like large um, marine predators. And so uh, I've always been really interested in, in this intersection between animals and their environment. But when you add in human impacts to this, and, and in this example I'm using fisheries, um, you know, from a science perspective, this manifests itself as this kind of interaction between fisheries and uh, animals that they target or incidentally um, interact with. And I would argue that the link between these things, so human impacts on whatever the, the biology is that we're talking about, is, um, is linked by ocean dynamics. Is, is the, the environment in the ocean is a critical link between those two things. And so I think you know, effectively managing something like a marine fishery is critically dependent on the dynamics that link those two, those two things. So that's kind of to get, paint a picture for you of, of my kind of scientific worldview, if you will. So in order to try to solve some of these problems, I've been working as a member of a team of scientists who are really trying to improve our understanding of the ocean by studying the animals that live in it. So that's kind of my number one uh, objective. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a day in the life of what it's like to do this kind of science. Um, because, you know, it might sound like a pretty sexy gig, like, you know, you go out and like hold these sharks and you get to interact with the animals, which you do get to do, and I'll show you some of that. Um, but in fact, a lot of my days actually look like this. So I, I spend a lot of time behind the computer analyzing data, for one, which is pretty fun. Um, but also, you know, writing grant proposals, writing papers, um, communicating with collaborators. So there's a lot of time behind the computer that you maybe don't expect when you hear a talk like this that's, uh, you know, big and flashy and has lots of cool pictures. On the other hand, I am pretty lucky in that I get to go out and do um, a lot of cool things with a lot of really neat animals in really cool places around the world. Uh, one of the main tools that I use is called a satellite tag. Uh, which you'll see a couple examples of in this photo. So this is a blue shark that we're tagging uh, in New England off of Cape Cod. Uh, this is for my PhD. Uh, here's one satellite tag here in my right hand, and there's another tag on the other side of this fin. You can just see the antenna sticking up there. So there are a whole bunch of different configurations and sensors that you can put on these things, but essentially satellite tags as a family are just these tiny computers that have some combination of sensors that tell you something about the animal. So at the heart of it, we're tracking how the animal moves around in the ocean, some metrics about the animal's behavior, and then usually some things about the environment too, as simple as temperature, for example. So uh, we, we try to put all these things together, not only to understand the animals themselves, but also to understand the marine environment as well. So I'll show you a little bit about uh, what this looks like. So a typical day in the field for me, when we're doing a lot of this work, like with blue sharks that you saw there, looks like this. <laughs> so to fish for blue sharks or other animals 80 or 100 miles offshore, you have to get up super, super early every day <laughs> to go tagging. So this is what the, the start of every single day looks like when you're doing this kind of work, which can be exhausting. But um, I brought a video clip to show you what the rest of the day looks like after the sun comes up. I'm not an actor, I'm a scientist. We're at 30 miles off today. Uh, Cape Cod, chasing blue mango sharks, avoiding the taco, catching that. And he is working on catching up with another blue shark right now. There he goes. So we've been catching and tagging a lot of sharks over the last couple of days. We've been out here for two solid days, fished all night. And uh, we've caught and released a bunch of sharks. We're trying to be really selective, get the largest, most healthy animals, get some tags on them. I'll talk over the second half a little bit, it's just music. Um, so you can kind of see what this looks like, right? We would essentially go out, put some fishing gear in the water, hopefully catch something, bring it on the boat and put some tags on. So you kind of got the idea from that. One of the interesting side notes to this that you may not know is that we do all our own filming, all our own science communication, all our video, own video editing and all that stuff. And I learned that right here at the College of Idaho on a trip to Australia. So when your professors assign you tasks or, or projects that you think are maybe not as relevant as they should be, it's going to come full circle, I promise. <laughs> so, um, you know, those skills are a lot more transferable than you might think. So this is one of those satellite tags going on the dorsal fin of a blue shark. That 
Chuck has a cool story to tell his friends, probably. <laughs> so I'll, I'll break this down just a little bit, just so we can actually talk about some of the pieces, just because I think some of the components of what happens are pretty interesting. Um, so you know, once we are connected to a shark or doing fishing like you see here, um, there are a lot of things that have to happen pretty quickly, right? So we figure out what species it is, what sex it is, what size it is. Um, and in, in this project in particular, I was really interested in the largest, most healthy animals that are going to go offshore, away from the coast, to study open ocean kinds of, of processes. So I have to sort of do this kind of multivariate thing in your head to ultimately decide, am I going to put anywhere from four to $8,000 worth of tags on this one animal? and then repeat you know, for another 10 or 15 or 20 animals. So it's kind of interesting, this decision-making process that has to happen. Um, so it, in that video, that was made in about a weekend, and we caught, I think, about 60 sharks, and we tagged eight. So we're, you know, we're being really selective, and we have to go through a lot of repetition to get the animals that we're most interested in studying. Um, so once the decision to tag something is made, uh, we bring the shark through a door in the back of the boat that I think you saw in that film, and the tagging team kind of goes to work like a NASCAR pit crew, um, which you saw in the video, and here's just another example of that. So there's all kinds of different measurements that have to be taken, and a well-coordinated team that are staying away from the business end um, while the captain is dealing with the teeth. And so that's, that's kind of the, the short of it. And here's just another image of what it looks like, you know, putting it. So this is another tag in my right hand, and the, the fin-mounted tag is, is already done. So. Just a nice picture to be able to actually see the animal. And after about, it usually takes about five or so minutes, um, this is kind of what the release looks like. So we're being very selective so that when we do release an animal, it swims away like that. You know, super happy. It has, it's had a seawater hose in its mouth for five minutes or so while it's on the deck, so they're usually pretty healthy when they're released. So you can imagine that these are pretty fun days on the boat, right? But they're really long, as I mentioned. They start dark and they end dark. Um, and they're pretty stressful because there's all this decision making happening, you're kind of coordinating a team, you're staying away from the teeth. Um, but our, our reward really from doing all this is that these sharks send us information about both themselves and the ocean for years to come afterwards, which is, which is a pretty um, rewarding experience. And the information that we gather from this, these tags that we're putting on these animals kind of helps us reveal the secrets in the lives of these animals and, and also teaches us about the ocean, which is, which is pretty cool. So that's a little bit of the day in the life stuff. And then I just wanted to bring you back to this to remind you that this is kind of the, the way that I approach the actual scientific questions of a lot of this work, which is you know, how these animals interact with fisheries via the environment. And I think it's really important to think about this in the context of using these animals as kind of evolutionarily informed oceanographers, right? Because we're interested in the animals. We're also interested in the ocean. And so we can, you know, they've evolved in that environment and presumably know a lot more about it than we do via evolution. And so by putting tags on them, we're kind of cheating a little bit, right? We're using them to teach us about the ocean, which is, which is pretty neat. And it turns out that when you do that, they actually teach you about some of the most biologically interesting places in what is otherwise a pretty remote and very vast landscape that we don't really have a good understanding of. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. Here's just an example of, of some of the data that comes back from one of these tags, just to kind of give you a sense for what this looks like. Um, so this is kind of first cut, right? We do all the tagging and then we wait, and then this data comes in via satellite, and we can make maps that look something like this. So this is a blue shark, um, like in the video, it was tagged somewhere here off of Cape Cod, and all these orange dots are just positions where that shark's fin broke the surface of the ocean, and that tag said, hey, satellite, I'm over here, just like your phone does with the, with the mapping app or something. So the same, same idea. And then this white dot is just the last data point when I made this map. So you can see that you know, this fish swam uh, about 8,000 kilometers or something in less than a year. So these are highly pelagic, open ocean migratory animals. Uh, and we're studying you know, the processes out here in the open ocean. So they're perfect for uh, what we're trying to do. And then, of course, kind of the second step in the whole analysis phase, if you're trying to think about this scientifically, is, well, what about the environment makes the animals do what they're doing? So you can do things like you know, put a sea surface temperature map underneath. And you guys, without knowing probably anything about blue sharks or sea surface temperature, can probably make some inferences about what, what sea surface temperature is doing and how it's affecting behavior in a map like this. So these are just very basic kind of examples of, of what it looks like to really do this science. 
maybe what's most interesting here, like I mentioned, is the idea of using these animals as um, oceanographers, right, to teach us about the ocean. And this is a great example of what that looks like. So I'm going to show you tracking data for a short fin mako shark, uh, which was also tagged here off of Cape Cod. So I've, now I'm showing you some colors underneath, which are some representation of the environment. doesn't really matter what they are. Um, but you'll see what happens when this animal in the flashing green moves away from Cape Cod. And you see this red feature. This is called an eddy. This animal interacts with that feature over and over and over and over for like three straight weeks. Now, we can... We know that these eddies are there by using satellites and sea surface temperature, et cetera. We have no, like, historically we think that eddies like that, oh, I forgot to show you, that's a hot spot. Um, eddies like that have historically been considered these like ocean deserts. Like there's nothing there, they're warm, there's no productivity, nothing, it's just empty. And then we tag these top predators and they do that. They live there for three straight weeks. I guarantee you that a short fin mako is not gonna live in the ocean desert for three straight weeks, right, by choice. So we started doing tagging like this, and these animals behave in this way, and they interact with these features, like an eddy in this case. And we're like, huh, maybe that's actually a pretty interesting environment. So these eddies are you know, these kind of swirling water masses. Like if you flush your toilet, right, and it goes, shh, like spins down, that's basically what an eddy is, except it's 200 miles wide instead of you know, 10 inches wide. And it moves much more slowly, but it still has that effect from the surface all the way down. It's a totally different environment than all the surrounding water. And so these animals, of course, can sense it, number one. But number two, there's a reason that they're hanging out there. For some reason, it's interesting to them. And they're a predator, so I would probably guess it's food, but who knows. So a lot of the ocean dynamics that I've been mentioning as this important link between fish and fisheries are shown in this animation. And this is just to show you how complex ocean dynamics really are and how important it is for us to use these animals as these kind of sentinels, right, to go out and, and teach us what's most interesting to them. And here I'll show you just an example of eddies because I'm going to give you an eddy result. So, you know, here's Florida, here's the Cape Cod stuff we were doing, this is the Gulf Stream here. And so these are all examples of eddies, these kind of closed circles that look pretty energetic in the animation. So, fast forward about four years of my life of working on a PhD. This is the answer. For that, for this specific aspect, so you know, I tagged about 25 blue and mako sharks or so to try to understand how they specifically used eddies because of that first one we tagged to this interesting behavior, and we thought, let's look at eddies and see what's going on because everyone else thinks they're a desert, and we seem to disagree. And so we did a bunch of tagging, and it turns out that a lot of these predators use these warm eddies, and it seems like when they're in those features, they're doing a lot of diving into the deep ocean. And so I would hypothesize that that's probably for foraging, because why else would they be diving into the deep ocean as a predator if there's nothing down there for them to eat? So we could talk about that in the Q&A the maybe about why we got to that conclusion, but it seems like these features were almost like a, like a highway to connect these predators that are primarily oriented to the surface and something going on in the deep ocean. So. The next thing I did, I, this eddy thing is, is pretty interesting from an oceanographic perspective because of the history of these features being ocean deserts, okay? So, so that was kind of answer number one. But then I thought, well, you know, we've tagged a couple different species, maybe 20 animals or, or whatever, that are doing this, but we have tag data from like 200 animals in, in various resolutions and stuff that I don't really want to go into. We couldn't do the same kind of analysis, but we could look at how they're diving in those features. And so that's exactly what I did. I took about I think we had about 20 different species, about 150, 200 tag data sets. And it turns out, with just kind of this back of the envelope calculation, that nearly every single top predator that we tag dives into the deep ocean. I mean, eddies or no eddies, we couldn't really do that in this analysis, but they're all diving into the deep ocean. So this is in meters, and these are individual dives for just four different example species. And what you'll notice is that, sure, there are some differences based on the physiology of those animals, but they're all diving to you know, below 800 meters. This is 2,500 feet deep in the ocean, so it's completely dark, completely dark. It's super cold, the pressure's high. Like, why would all of these top predators be going there? And so you know, this gives us some kind of, of framework within which to start to interpret the results that we're getting when we can contextualize, you know, we tag one animal and it does this, well, all these other animals are doing something similar, right? 
And so my hypothesis from this is that this guy is what drives all of this behavior. So this is a deep water fish called the mctophid, also known as a bristlemouth. And there are billions of these fish in the deep ocean that we're just starting to understand as of like four or so years ago. And four years ago, there's a paper came out that, is, that um, changed the way we think about the deep ocean and concluded that there's about an order of magnitude more biomass in the deep ocean than we previously thought. Order of magnitude more. So the conclusion from that is that, you know, these are not only the largest amount of fish biomass in the world, but it's also like the largest aggregation of fish in the world as well in kind of this layer in the deep ocean. And so now we're starting to put two and two together to think that maybe these are really supporting this amazing and kind of enigmatic ecosystem in the deep, dark ocean um, that I sort of think of as kind of forming this deep ocean buffet from a predator's perspective. So that's kind of a back of the envelope, um, and it's not a particularly satisfying result um, because of the, the way the analysis was done, pretty much. But what that project did do was it motivated um, the creation of the Ocean Twilight Zone project. So this is something that we kicked off while I was at um, Woods Hole doing my PhD, and it's uh, upwards of $30 million private donation to the institution and some other partners to actually go and explore the deep ocean. For the, pretty much for the first time. And so, you know, my role in this was, you know, coming from the top predator perspective, which is, which is really useful for a lot of reasons. But there are a lot of things you can't do with top predators. And so there's a lot of engineering expertise at a place like Woods Hole. So they're actually building some of these deep ocean robots to send down and actually figure out if all these predators are going there, there's got to be something interesting. Well, what is it? What's happening there? And so we can send down robots like this. This is called the Mesobot that just finished development uh, a few months ago. We're doing prototype deployments on it now. So, you know, when, when I was sitting in this room, like you guys are, you know, hearing presentations like this, I never thought that, you know, I'd be playing with robots in the deep ocean. Like, no idea. Like, I'm not an engineer. I don't do anything with robotics. But by working with other people who have that expertise and providing my own in a totally different field, we're putting together these really cool big projects that are kind of pushing the frontier of, of our understanding of the deep ocean, which I think is, is really exciting. And that kind of, you know, that's what makes me get out of bed in the morning. Like, that's really exciting to me um, to kind of explore one of these last frontiers on the planet. I want to wrap up kind of the science portion of this with just a, a little kind of flavor of some of the other projects I have going on, just so you guys get a sense for like what it's like to kind of juggle these different projects being a, a scientist doing research. Um, so last year we got a, a NASA award that is essentially, um, we're, we're just kicking it off now, but the idea is to understand how animals interact with dynamics in the ocean, like eddies, currents, temperature, etc., and make dynamic predictions about where fish are going to be and where the things we don't want to catch, like seals, are going to be. And that way we can send people who are trying to catch, say, swordfish, to places where they're most likely to catch swordfish and avoid catching things they want to avoid, like turtles and seals and, and whatever. So that's primarily a you know, s satellite remote sensing exercise mixed with, with animal movement data. So we're just starting that now, but I think that's a really cool way to um, start you know, understanding this animal environment fishery interaction and then projecting forward into kind of climate change scenarios. I mentioned to you the Ocean Twilight Zone project. Um, more engineering stuff, which I never expected. We're also working on a new fish technology with some industry partners, which is also something I never really thought I'd be doing. Um, so, you know, it's a couple different academic institutions and, a, and an industry partner, and we're building new technologies, which is, which is really exciting. Uh, and then this is a, just another tag that we're working on as well, again, to kind of inform climate science in the ocean. So that's the end of some of the sciencey, maybe fire hose stuff, but I thought it might be a little bit fun to try to end with um, some more pretty pictures. And so, you know, I guess why study big charismatic megafauna if you don't get to share some of, the, some of these images with, with people? Um, so as Dr. Walser mentioned, when I finished at C of I, I did a master's in marine science and engineering in Saudi Arabia, which is in the Red Sea, which you see in that circle there. And I was mostly studying movement and ecology of mantas. And there's just an image of what that looks like, satellite tag being deployed on a manta. I promise he's fine after that, but they don't like it initially. Um, 
Yeah, so I've, I've had the opportunity to study a lot of other cool things in a lot of other cool places. So this is Devil Rays in the Azores, which is uh, an island owned by Portugal in the North Atlantic. We're studying here in an aggregation site. And you can see this, just this whole group of them comes out of the, out of the blue. And this is about, you know, maybe two inches from my head. One of the other jobs I did during my PhD that kind of helped fund some of the tuition and stuff for my, for my PhD work was I worked on a project for my advisor that was on coral reef food webs, right? So I went from, you know, mantas and whale sharks and all these big predators to like these tiny little fish on coral reefs and like scraping algae off the rocks and stuff to try to understand who eats who, pretty much. And so I spent a lot of time leading these field expeditions to the middle of nowhere in the Central Pacific, like 3,000 miles from the next human being, to study these pristine coral reefs, try to understand, you know, if we're gonna rehab some coral reef environments, what's our, what are we, what's our goal? What are we trying to get to? What do these pristine reefs really look like and how do they function? And so we went to, you know, basically, it, my advisor designed it this way, I'm sure, you know, pick the prettiest, best, most amazing coral reef in the world, and that's where we're gonna go do research. <laughs> and so that's where I got to go. And so we were, we were studying coral reef fish and other um, you know, coral reef kind of food web dynamics on these super remote, uh, uninhabited islands in the middle of nowhere. And this is what a healthy coral reef shark population looks like. Now keep in mind, this is where we were spearfishing and like sampling little fish off the reef. It was pretty exciting. <laughs> But you know, when you go snorkeling or scuba diving on a coral reef somewhere, like this is what you should be seeing for for you know shark populations in that in that area. And I promise you, you probably don't. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, you remember that Dr. Walser mentioned I did some work on whale sharks here when I was doing my honors thesis, and that was all in the Red Sea. Later, I spent some time in the Red Sea working on whale sharks. But that project was so successful that we then expanded into the North Atlantic. And in the Red Sea, we were working mostly on juveniles, and in the North Atlantic, we started working on adults. And I just, I have to show you guys this video because I think it's so cool, and I hope you guys do too. <laughs> so we're about 100 miles offshore in warm Gulf Stream water with a spotter plane. And we're out on the boat, and we're spotting these guys at the surface. So that's a relatively small whale shark. That's probably eight meters or so. And you can see we're here jumping in off the boat. And they just kind of hang out at the surface all the time, pretty much. And you can swim up to them like I'm doing here with a pretty harmless looking weapon. You can see there's already a tag attached right there, floating. And I just put another one in right there. So we put two tags on that shark. Then of course we had to get lots of photos, and drone footage, and all kinds of stuff. So we've only managed to tag a couple in that region right now because they're just not very common. But I think that's a, a pretty cool example of how you know a relatively small scale project in this one little area provides such compelling results. So like we really need to expand this um, into other areas, and then of course we get to do some pretty cool stuff like you saw in that video. So, you know, I've had to work, the opportunity, I've been really lucky to work on a lot of other species in a lot of other places, but I'm not really showing you all these videos because, just because I think they're cool, although I think they're, they're pretty fun to watch. But, you know, I guess I'm trying to demonstrate to you that the reason I do this work, which is certainly not for the money, I promise you, but it, it makes me excited to go to work every day, right? And I think that, you know, when I was sitting in your position, that's kind of what I was trying to make my decisions based around, right? It's like, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? that'll make me excited to get out of bed and go and do it. And so, you know, I think I've kind of found something that gets me pretty excited, which is to, you know, ask questions about the natural world that I think are most interesting, um, and ultimately convince other people that they're interesting too, uh, and then use those knowledge gains, essentially, to improve the way that we manage a lot of these species. And, you know, I want to highlight that I'm not standing up here talking to you today because you know I'm some extraordinary scientist, right? Like a few years ago, I was sitting right here in your guys' chairs. I'm like a normal person, just like you. So this isn't like something that's not attainable, right? I mean, it's just it's a product of you know working hard and and trying to you know 
gain yourself opportunities to keep moving down whatever track it is that you that you choose. But I thought it would be important just to show you that, you know, just like you, not that long ago, I bounced around several majors at College of Idaho before I got hooked on environmental studies. I identified plants with Dr. Mansfield. You know, I gave presentations at the student research conference. I even cheered on the purple and gold. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I'm just an average guy, just like you guys. So, you know, if you have goals like this in science or whatever else they are, um, you know, they're they're not unattainable, right? It just you just have to work hard and, and be driven, but you can go and, and achieve these things. I think, you know, regardless of your specific career objectives, um, I was talking with Dr. Walser a little bit, and I thought maybe it would be kind of fun just to put together a few tips for sort of science E careers, whether that's science research or science communication or kind of anything that revolves around, you know, doing science. And I think maybe the, there are two keys here. One is practice science. So at the College of Idaho, you have incredible opportunities to actually just practice doing science in like a pretty low stakes environment, right? You fail a lab experiment, you know, no big deal, but you learn from failing that lab experiment, right? So you have tons of opportunities to go in the field, to work in the lab, to practice doing real science. So um, take advantage of those opportunities. And the other thing I wanna highlight is to seek out opportunities and do it early. So the earlier that you start to seek out opportunities like summer internships or whatever they are, the earlier you can start to kind of narrow in on what it is that actually makes you tick, that you want to do for the rest of your life that makes you happy. Um, and I think I did a pretty good job of that here with help from a lot of other people at the college. So lean on your you know, network here, whether it's advisors or friends or collaborators, whatever it is, to try to help you get those opportunities to figure out what it is that you, that you really enjoy. And so with that, you know, I guess I'll just show some of the collaborators I've had. There's a huge list of people who have helped me get to this point, tons and tons of various funding agencies, um, and I don't really want to talk too much about that, so I'll just, let's, let's talk about what you guys want to talk about. Thanks. <laughs> I guess I'll just say that, it, I have, like Chris mentioned, I have to run out after this, but feel free to email me. My email's right there, write it down or whatever. Um, take a picture and email me if you have more questions or whatever. I'd be happy to talk to any of you about any questions you have. So. Questions? Yeah? What else do those tags, like, data that they give you besides, like, temperature? The, so it's changing all the time. Um, there's things like temperature, movements. Uh, we're starting to do dissolved oxygen. Uh, salinity is coming, but it's not there yet. Um, light levels. You can do all kinds of really creative things. Like um, there are some tags that are two parts. So one part you feed to an animal, like a shark or a seal or whatever, um, and it kind of stays in their stomach for a week or two before they pass it, and you can measure stomach temperature. Uh, you can do small incisions and actually insert tags inside the body cavity and do internal temperatures that way. Um, it's, it's a really crazy trade-off between you know, what your question is, what your species is, how you want to get the data back. For doing stuff in the open ocean, that's probably the biggest one, is you know, you're not going to see these animals again. So the tag has to fall off or be programmed to jettison itself off or something so that it can get to the surface and talk to satellites and send you information. Um, there's some exceptions to that, like for something like a tuna where you, you catch a large portion of the population, you can actually physically recover that same fish sometimes, but yeah, it's a very complicated question, yeah. but it's, it's changing all the time. I mean, you saw two of those four little squares I had for kind of developing projects are tag development. So it's a huge thing in the field right now to try to answer new questions with new technologies. That's a good question. Though. They're very expensive, those tags as well. <laughs> because of all this engineering, right, that goes into it, it's, that's maybe one of the most prohibitive things about what we do is just the cost of ship time and technologies. It's pretty tough. Others? Yeah. So for the eddies, when you talked about uh, possibly predators were going there to feed and everything, could it also be a possibility that they go there to reproduce? It could be. Yeah, it could be. But I think eddies are too ephemeral for that to be a reliable reproductive strategy, I think. There are other things that eddies could be for, for example, thermoregulation. So they're, in that example, those eddies were much warmer. 
So I interpret that as, you know, these animals like the warm water and that kind of connects the surface in deep ocean via that kind of vein of warm water. But that might not be the case. I mean, maybe they're in those features because that's metabolically where they want to be, for example. You know, the other, one of the other leading hypotheses just for deep diving in general, not necessarily in eddies, is navigation. So a lot of animals kind of integrate signals from, you know, solar signals, but also magnetics. And diving down into the ocean can help clear away some of the noise from magnetic signals. So it could be a navigation strategy. One of my, uh, the work I did in the, on mantas in the Red Sea, those species tend to almost like go to sleep and kind of glide down to the water column. So it looks like they're diving deep, but they're really just kind of resting or gliding to be efficient. And then they get to some point where they're not comfortable anymore and they swim back up and then they do it again. So there's a whole, there's a lot of different stuff going on there. Yeah, that's a really good question. The short answer is we don't know, I think. Which kind of shows you the state of this field, right? It's, it's pretty wild. It's 2019 and we don't even know why fish dive into the deep ocean. Yeah. Other questions? Does it make you want to do more like biomedical in or engineering, like get more techie to figure out how to create your own tag? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, 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 there's a lot of groups around the world doing that kind of, yeah, biomedical or engineering kind of collaborations. You know, you guys maybe have heard some of the biomedical stuff now is like, not just wearable devices, but actually, you know, like almost like skins that kind of stick on, right? You, you guys are younger than me. You probably are like, oh yeah, that was so last year. Um, but, you know, we're starting to build tags like that now. They're just almost adhesive and you can just slap them onto something and eventually they fall off. So they're less invasive and all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, so there's, I think that niche is not exploited as much as it could be, but there's some work in that, in that field for sure. It's just the problem with biomedical, right, is like it's not very profitable for them to do this kind of stuff. So they'd much rather work on people, but yeah. How long yeah. do the tags last? Uh, it really depends. So the, <clears throat> the one that you saw in my right hand in that photo, we were talking about the tags. Uh, we programmed those, so they actually have like a little wire in the nose cone that um, at some point, you send an electric current through this little, like, this little piece right here, and it corrodes the wire and the tag detaches itself. So you have pretty good control over that, and usually that's about six months. It's kind of a trade-off between battery power and you know, duration. Obviously, you want as much data as you can get, so there's a trade-off there. Um, these ones actually don't really have a limited um, attachment period, so that's why we're trying to work on some of these engineering things, because you know, this is like surgical grade equipment that this is on with and everything. And eventually, probably, uh, there's limited evidence that these will actually get pushed out of the fin like a sliver, like, you know, our body would push a sliver out. But yeah, these batteries last about five years and then that's it. So, you know, we rarely see these animals again, but the ones we do see rarely have the tags left anymore. And there's, you know, it's like some scarring on the fin and stuff like that. So that's a main impetus to really drive development of things that are less invasive. Other so, questions? Yeah. Cameron, have you had any of your tagged sharks caught in a fishery? So, or a boat, you know, from, I don't know, Japan or China ends up catching one of your tagged sharks and do they report back to you or do they, you know, what yeah. happens to that animal? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, the answer is yes. Um, it's super variable depending on the species. So something like a whale shark, you're, you're almost guaranteed to not ever see that fish or that tag again, and they're not going to get caught in the fishery, usually. Uh, unless you're maybe in Indonesia where sometimes that happens. But like in the North Atlantic, no. But, you know, I was shocked when you're tagging something like a blue shark or a mako. I mean, those are pretty heavily exploited species. And yeah, I think I tagged about 15 blue sharks just for my PhD alone, and at least six of them were captured. And that's just me tagging this from this tiny little spot, right? A very small number of the a fraction of the population. So yeah, I mean, there was a paper by some, some of the people who I work with, I think it was last, last year, two years ago, on shortfin mako in the North Atlantic, which is a really heavily exploited species because it's delicious and there's a reason for it. Um, and yeah, there it was like 30% recapture all in fisheries. And in their case, it was a combination of industrial and private fisheries. Um, in my case with the blue sharks, it's almost exclusively the Portuguese because it's North Atlantic and the Portuguese are 
primarily that open ocean kind of fleet. Um, and they actually target blue sharks as well because they can sell them. So, yeah. But it depends a lot, yeah. On, on, I mean, the tuna stuff is, yeah, you get a lot of tags back when you're tagging tuna, hmm. as you might imagine, bluefin or something. Yeah. Others? Yeah. How great in the fact do you anticipate that being able to predict where different fish species are located will have on other fish populations? Well, I think right now the biggest advantage to understanding where things go, which is a pretty simple question, right? I mean, we don't really have good answers to just where does this thing go and when. So that's a pretty basic science question that you saw a lot of um, in, in this talk. But the next step which I briefly mentioned is being able to actually predict where animals are in relation. To, so usually you use the environment to do that because that's kind of the best way to predict where they're hanging out. Um, you know, so if you know that uh, a tuna likes a certain temperature range, right, when you can start to accurately predict based on the environment where these animals are, then you can, as a manager, start kind of moving the chess pieces to figure out where you can or cannot exploit that resource. Right, so what I think is maybe interesting for, for you guys is that you know in the next couple decades there's some pretty serious moral questions that come along with that right we're gonna I'm, I'm confident that we're gonna be good at predicting where animals are in the ocean in the next two decades like we'll, we'll be there and I'll be able to tell you if you want to catch this species go here and you'll also be able to avoid this species or whatever it is right you can kind of do some overlays and stuff and, and figure that out but you know, how close do you hold those cards if you're a manager or a scientist? Or do you just say it's free game within the limits of how, the quotas that we, that we set for numbers of fish to catch, for example? So that's something that I really struggle with, actually, is kind of the, the moral and ethical dilemmas that are associated with being able to predict where these things are and just go and get them. It was like mining a resource at that point, right? Yeah, go ahead. Aaron, you mentioned the quotas, and I wondered if you have the same problem with a lot of these uh, shark species, blue mango, that you see with blue, uh, blue fin tuna in terms of quotas being exceeded. Um, and, and what your, your research informs you in, in terms of population dynamics as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, the, the short answer on population dynamics is we're still trying to get at even just connectivity and mixing. Right? We don't know where to even draw the lines on populations for these highly migratory species. So that's kind of question number one. Um, but yeah, the, the quota question is that there really isn't one for things like blue sharks. It's kind of free game, especially in the open ocean and the high seas. It's almost no regulation. So yeah, you just catch whatever you want. And the, the answer is, you know, for decades we've been doing that on a lot of species. And that's pretty much causing widespread collapse in a lot of these you know, top predator populations in these open ocean ecosystems in particular, um, you know, the coastal ecosystems have already collapsed and now that's moving into the open ocean. Um, you know, something like a short fin mako is, I hope, going to be a success story in that, you know, we've been fishing them down for a really, really long time. And just last year, the National Marine Fisheries Service kind of woke up to the realization, based on that paper I mentioned, where 30% of the tagged animals got caught, they kind of went, whoa, <laughs> like we got to do something about this. And so they actually put in an emergency moratorium on shortfin mako, and that's kind of trickling through the bureaucracy now. And I think, I mean, I'm a bit of an optimist, but I think that's going to that's gonna help the makos a lot. I think we'll see them start to come back. But a lot of the others, like oceanic white tips, I mean, we're probably not going to see them in huge numbers like they were ever again. So, yeah. It's tricky. But the, the open ocean and especially the the like blue sharks that have been considered almost like trash species until recently yeah there's not really any quotas it's it's free for all really that'll change but others yeah um is there any environmental concern for like when the tags fall off potentially get off the animal and really yeah that's a great question right now i think it's so much of a drop in the bucket that it doesn't really matter but i agree with you that I think at some point it's going to be a, a serious environmental concern. I mean, the flip side of that argument is, you know, the plastic bottles alone that in one, you know, state or country compared to the amount of tags going in the ocean is so, you know, it's just totally disproportionate. But, but yes, I don't think we can just keep throwing tags in the ocean with no 
idea of you know what happens to them or the environmental consequences of doing that. So, yeah, there's a lot of work on you know biofouling and how these things degrade and, and all that kind of stuff too. So it's a slow process, but we'll get there, I think. Yeah. Along those same lines, how has the plastic in the ocean affected the predators that you work with? Predators that I work with, not a heck of a lot. Um, I think, well, I think the sharks are probably, you know, kind of aggregating a lot of the toxins that move up the food web, but no one really cares if, like, blue sharks have mercury in them or whatever it is, PCBs. So I think, like, something like a blue shark, the answer is we don't know and most people don't care, which is kind of sad. Um, but in things like tuna that are, you know, these really prized food fish, of course, then all kinds of toxins from plastics and other sources are aggregated up pretty rapidly, actually. Um, there's a really interesting paper from the, some of the nuclear issues that were happening in, in Asia a couple years ago, that, that um, there were signatures of that that were, um, you could detect them in tissues of tuna that were kind of born around that time. And in that part of the Pacific, you know, they migrate all the way across, east to west and back. And so we could sample fish like off the California coast that had clear um, you know, signals of the Fukushima nuclear issues. Which is pretty scary, honestly. <laughs> Um, yeah, but plastics, you know, is mostly, it's hard because we don't really understand how the, you know, the toxins and how the chemicals break down and then move up the food web in these guys. Um, but certainly in things like whales and seabirds, uh, you know, like the filter feeding whales, I mean, they just swim around with their mouth open all the time and filter out everything that's in the water. So yeah, it's plankton, but it's also plastic. And you see increasing news coverage of, you know, dead marine mammals that are just have, you know, 50 pounds of plastic in their stomach for the last years of feeding. So, yeah, I, did, I wish I had a good answer for that one. That's that's going to be a huge problem in the near future. Yeah. Sorry to be so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what I think. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Torx thrower was here last year, perhaps for the same uh, thing, and he was talking about how critical sharks are for the Yeah, that's, that's pretty much, we were working with Forrest and others in that coral reef project that I only sort of briefly mentioned because that wasn't really something that I led except for the field aspect of that. But that's exactly what we were doing. We were going to these really pristine environments that are kind of this inverted trophic pyramid kind of thing, right, that Forrest works on a lot as well. And the whole idea was, you know, who's eating who here? Like, where's all this energy coming from to support this super heavy, you know, population of top predators where you don't really see that much productivity. I mean, we're in the tropics at, you know, two degrees south where the water, like you saw in that video, is just crystal clear. I mean, there's presumably not much productivity, and yet you have these beautiful coral reefs with all kinds of fish, and the corals are thriving, and there's tons of top predators. And so that's still a, a big question, you know, where does all this energy come from? Uh, and then the next question, of course, is if we're going to manage coral reefs, how do we get coral reefs in the Caribbean back to what they should be? Um, so we're not quite there yet, but I think the short answer from the really pristine reefs is that a lot of that, um, that energy is coming from the open ocean and it just kind of happens to aggregate in these, in these coral reef environments. They're almost like a filter, right? That water is just constantly washing on and the reefs are really good at sucking that up, whether it's nutrients or you know, phytoplankton, whatever it is. And then that is pushed into the top predator community that happens to be much more long lived. And so that's kind of, I think, how that, those results mm -hmm. are playing out. But um, yeah, it's great. I mean, that, that the project, we were doing the field work for that like five years ago. And you know, we're getting a lot of the results now. But you know, it's 2019, and we still don't know that. And it's crazy to me. Yeah. Other questions? Don't be shy. So what, what is it about the Phoenix Islands that makes them so pristine? Just their remoteness? Yeah. Or is there a history of managing the, the fishery? Or? Uh, there's not much of a history of managing the fishery. Um, it's mostly that they're just really, really far from anything. Um, it takes three days by boat to get there from anywhere. 
whether it's Hawaii or Fiji, those are the two closest um, inhabited places. Um, but there was, there was a history of U.S. military activity actually on one of the islands. I believe that was World War II. So it's really weird when you go there, right? They're these like super pristine atolls that just come out of the middle of just the blue emptiness. And then you get there and there's like all these old rusted out like U.S. war jeeps and stuff. It's really strange because no one ever cleaned it up. Yeah. So this is the empty islands full of like old military gear. It's really weird. Um, but yeah, they've been fishing mostly tunas there, like all the international fleets. So the, 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 those islands are owned by the Republic of Kiribati, which you've probably never heard of because it's a really tiny little island nation. They have like thousands of islands as part of their republic, but they're spread all over everywhere and they don't have a very high you know, population or GDP or anything like that. So what, what they were doing is selling the fishing rights to all kinds of fishing fleets to come in and harvest their tuna. And that's how kind of they were sustaining the claim over those islands. Well, recently a bunch of conservation groups like CI stepped in along with a bunch of academic partners and said, A, we want to do a bunch of research here. This is one of the most pristine reef environments in the world. And two, we'll pay you to close it, make it a marine protected area, and you'll make the same amount of money as you would selling the fishing rights. So that happened in 2014 or 15. And then, you know, a year later, it was like, everything's closed. Like, no one can fish anything there. And it was like night and day. Like, it, you know, we can monitor some of this fishing activity from satellites. And there's a really interesting image from, you know, a week before the closure and the day or two after the closure. And it's just totally black and white, which is cool. I mean, that's a cool story, right? Um, but then you're also displacing that fishing effort elsewhere. So, you know, it's a bit of a catch-22. Um, but yeah, they're they're pristine because they're pretty well managed now, and no one lives there, and they're super remote. Yeah. But even there, right? You, the thing that was really surprising to me, other than the broken down war jeeps, is that you go onto one of the islands that hasn't seen a human for a decade or more, um, and the beaches are covered in plastic. Covered, like you can't even see the sand. It's just plastic, which is pretty insane. And then you you know you're diving on the reefs, and they're super pristine and there's coral reef fish everywhere and it's beautiful but if you start looking at the details there's like rusted hooks and line and nets and so I don't think you can find a reef anymore in the world that doesn't have all that kind of stuff going on but yeah I guess it's all relative but yeah. we got time for questions? one more question anyone last question everyone's too shy okay well email me if you have more questions Thanks for listening. Thank you.